It's so good to be together again and get to seek first the kingdom of God. Oh, we're believing for those results from the kingdom of God, aren't we? As we get into the context of God's goodness, his love, his mercy, and his promises. Precious Heavenly Father, we never want to take for granted the access we have to your precious Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're on assignment right now to help us, to help breathe on the word, the seed of God's word, and make it find its mark in our heart, and may it produce life, everlasting life. Father God, we ask you for wisdom, understanding, and your knowledge right now. In Jesus' precious name, we believe we receive it. Amen. Why we worship part two. This is such an exciting series because it's really giving us answers that are outside the spectrum of religion and enshrined worship. It's all about real worship. Why we worship, part two. The weapon of worship is what we're gonna focus on. But let's not get too far until we review in part one, we kind of had our doors blown off of our religious thinking, didn't we? We learned that worship is not about performance or form or ritual. No, 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 it's about results. Let me give you that definition of worship once again so that we can align up for part two of this series. Worship is providing a context for God to show up and be himself. Isn't that what you want? Praise God. Let's be honest here. When God shows up and can be himself in the room, stuff happens. Good stuff happens. Yes, miracles take place. Blessings are distributed. Why? Because God's character can't help but be true and be himself. He's a giver. He's the blesser. He's the provider, the healer. He's the light. He's the life. As I said in part one, outcome, outcome, outcome. That's why we worship. Now, Unfortunately, some religious person right now is thinking, well, now, Brother Stephen, that's just very transactional, and I believe that we should just worship the Lord, expecting nothing, but just because he's the Lord, we should worship him and expect nothing, and that guy's probably getting nothing. How pious. What a pious, arrogant thought. That's knifing God's character in the back. He's the source of all life. To worship him and expect nothing is to disrespect, dishonor, and diminish the perfection of his character. I don't want to do that. God doesn't just give. He is the giver, the blesser, the healer. God is like, you're asking him to come into the room, but somehow not shine? Mm. We learn that there is worship, but then there is true worship, as Jesus said. John 4, verse 23. But a time is coming and is already here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. We live in a world where people experience insincere praise. You know, you look good today, Jim. Oh, what a mess. Ladies, you wouldn't tolerate your husband giving you insincere praise, would you? Honey, I, I think that looks really good on you. Right, ladies, you wouldn't put up with that. God the Father is looking for true worshipers. That's you. That's me. With Christ in us, that's us. And we've begun to learn why true worship is a big deal to Father God, because not only is it what God desires from us, but it can be weaponized for our benefit. That's right. You heard me correctly. Worship can be weaponized to destroy enemies. Now, this builds on our foundation, part one, as we get into part two, the weapon of worship. Let's revisit the punchline that Jesus gave us when we walked through the story of King Jehoshaphat and the city of Jerusalem being surrounded by terrorists. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 20. And here, let's just get to the punchline, verse 22. And when they began to sing and praise, that's worship, the Lord set ambushments against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were destroyed. The enemies were destroyed. How? The weapon of worship. When Pam and I lived in Nashville years ago, 
actually it was Brentwood on the south side of Nashville, we had this really nice bird feeder that kind of telescoped off of our back deck, and you could see it from the great room. Pam loved to feed the little finches and the songbirds, and we get, we get a lot of cardinals and other songbirds looking for a Nashville record contract. That's what I used to tell Pam. She loved that. One day, I was up early praying in our great room and just worshiping God. I could see the bird feeder plainly, and on this day, a gang of ravens were terrorizing the little finches and songbirds. I didn't like it. It was distracting me from my prayers. The plight of the helpless little birds was calling to me, and their trouble was now my trouble. So what do I do? What, what can I do? Well, I prayed that I praised and worshiped God, and I reminded Father God that He had given me dominion over the animals in Genesis 1.26. So I worshiped God for His promises and His word, and I took authority over those ravens. And what happened? Well, like a bolt of lightning, a hawk seemed to come out of nowhere, and he nailed one of the crows right to the floor of our deck, and he had a talon. In one of his talons, he had this dead crow, and with the other, he easily hopped up on the railing with just one foot, and it was like he wanted me to see his breakfast. Then he flew up into the sugar maple in our backyard, and suddenly it was Jerusalem after the terrorists had been defeated. All the little birds came out from hiding, and they were singing and eating and making merry as Mr. Hawk ate his breakfast crow high in the tree, medium rare, right? So let me remind you again of how we landed part one of why we worship. Number one, humility is key to worship. We submit to God's word, his promises, and his way, his way of doing things. Number two, worship is key to results. We honor God expecting outcome. That really is faith, expecting outcome. And then number three, results confirm God's word. It's the goodness of God that leads people to rethink and to repent. People want what we have when what we have is better than what they have. You know, you can't convince people to turn to God's word if you don't have peace, joy, you're insecure, you're depressed all the time, blaming the government and living in shame. Now, now, if any of that is you, please do not feel condemned, but I want you to pay a special attention even more so, so that you can learn these secrets to the true worship, to worshiping truly so that you can activate kingdom results in your life the foundation of worship. Let's just get right to the foundation. You know, the foundation of anything is usually the most important and deciding factor of something. Like the foundation of your house. You may not see it much, but it is decisive about the build of your house, isn't it? It directs, it determines much of the outcome. With regard to the foundation of worship, we discovered in part one that it is spiritual protocol for coming into God's presence. After all, God is highest royalty, and it would only make sense that there is protocol for coming into a holy, almighty God's presence, right? Psalm 100, verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. You see, it's not about how earthly beautiful your voice is, but rather how heavenly beautiful your faith is. A little note here, God loves the sound of your faith. He just loves it. Now let's continue on. Psalm 100, starting at verse 4. Enter his gates with a song of thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful to him. Bless and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy and loving kindness are everlasting. His faithfulness endures to all generations. Now they're just a big stack of rewards. Notice how that when you practice proper spiritual protocol, immediately the word of God points to the rewards, his goodness, his mercy, his loving kindness, and his enduring faithfulness to your whole family. The most dangerous thing a believer can do is to think that the benefits of God's presence are just somehow random or automatic. They are on the other side of proper spiritual protocol for coming into his presence. Beware of ever interpreting God's word based on your terms my terms. True faith in God has nothing to do with your feelings, and yet we have believers making crucial decisions in life based on what they feel God wants them to do instead of what His Word says for them to do. 
Oh, you know, I just feel like God wants us to get married. Oh, I just feel like this is the job that God wants me to have. Oh, I just feel like God wanted me to buy this thing or that thing. And it's just as wrong to think that's how worship works. I worship the way I feel today. I'm just feeling this, so this is how I'm worshiping. Remember, Jesus told the woman at the well that God the Father is seeking true worshipers. That means we must know the true meaning of the term worship. God's definition, not mine, God's definition. So let's dig down to understand the foundation of worship. What does worship really mean? Why is it so important to God and to us? Is it really just singing? Is it shouting? Is it going to church and lifting your hands? Is it telling God what he wants to hear? Well, God must need me to tell him nice things, make him feel better or something. Is that it? Is worship what many other religions do? Bowing, sacrificing, fasting, self-abasing, and possibly even throwing yourself into a volcano to quench its fiery appetite? Is that really true worship? You know, down through history, there have been many religions and false gods that have demanded even human sacrifices, even unborn and newborn babies to be thrown into their fires. And today, most people think such demonic worship is just a thing of the past. But the truth is, we've only become more clinical and sanitized in our approach. We're still just as sinful and in need of a savior as 4,000 years ago. So again, what is true worship. The stuff that Jesus says, Father God is seeking. There's this thing called the law of first mention that the Bible scholars use to determine the overarching meaning or direction of a word found in the scriptures. So the way it works is that you take a word like worship and find the very first time it's used in the Bible, and by investigating the context and the use of that first mention, you can discover a prevailing principle or a fundamental that carries forward as the word is used over and over and again and again. We know God never changes. That's what Malachi 3.6 says. Therefore, his word is principle. It's unchanging. Let me say it this way. God doesn't redefine terms and evolve them to suit the culture. Mm-mm. He's constant and unchanging. What he said and meant 5,000 years ago, he still means today the same way. So let's look at this first mention of worship. In Genesis 22, it says that God tested or proved Abraham, the patriarch. Remember, Abraham and Sarah had been childless for their whole marriage. Finally, at the age of 100, Abraham gets his son Isaac from his beautiful 90-year-old wife, Sarah. Abraham adores this boy, Isaac, loves him to pieces. Now God tests Abraham and says, I want you to offer Isaac as a burnt offering up on one of these mountains. What? Is God really asking for human sacrifice? Are you kidding me? No. Come with me and let's see God's genius at work here. Abraham gets some wood, loads up a donkey with two servants helping him, and he brings his son Isaac along on this three-day journey. Finally, he sees the place where he's supposed to do this worship. Genesis 22, verse 5. And Abraham said to his servants, Settle down and stay here with the donkey, and I and the young man will go yonder and worship. And now listen to the, the end of this verse. And come again to you. Abraham believes him and the boy are going to come back to the servants. It's the very first mention of worship in the Bible. And did you see what Abraham said? I and the young man will go and worship and come again to you. We're both coming back to you. Okay, I'll say more about that, but first let's finish the story. They go up into the mountain where Abraham and Isaac build an altar. Isaac asks, where's the sacrifice, dad? And Abraham responds with, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. Abraham then binds up Isaac, lays him on the altar, and pulls out his sharp knife. As he raises the blade to slay his son, he hears the voice of the Lord. Do not lay your hand upon the lad, for now I know that you revere God, since you have not held back from me your son, your only son. 
Then old Abe unties Isaac and instantly sees a ram caught in the thicket by his horns so that he offers the ram in place of his son. After this time of sacrifice, worship, which is the act of trusting God at a cost, a price, God says to Abraham, blessing, I will bless you, and in multiplying, I will multiply you. Oh, very important. God also says, and in your seed, Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So now God introduces the idea of Christ, Father God's only begotten Son. What Abraham just did by faith is worship. God was saying, would bless the whole world. Abraham's faith did not withhold his only son, so God was able to give his only begotten son in response to Abraham's act of faith. Death was the great undefeated enemy of humanity. Sin brought death. God wanted to bring the blessing to earth, but someone had to have faith for a resurrection from death faith to overcome the grave, and the father of faith, Abraham, he did it. Abraham's worship introduced the promise of the blessing by faith. But listen to this, Abraham's worship was strategically weaponized against the curse, against death and sin. When Abraham offered his son, God could respond now and give his only begotten son, Jesus. And let's not forget why Jesus came. Jesus came to destroy. Oh, did you hear me? To destroy. That's right. Jesus came to bring down the hammer on the enemy of humanity, to destroy the curse. Why do you think Jesus let the soldiers bring the hammer down on the nails in his hands? For you, for me, he took our place to pay the price, but also to reverse the curse. Look at 1 John 3, verse 8. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Using that hammer to nail Jesus to the cross, it weaponized our worship. Colossians 2, starting at verse 14, says, Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of legal demands against us, which were hostile to us, and this certificate he has set aside and completely removed by nailing it to the cross. You see, Jesus nailed your sin debt to the cross. And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. Worship doesn't actually give you the victory. It welcomes the victory. The victory Christ has already won. Worship is welcoming God into your life, your situation, your sphere of influence. Yes, imagine this. It welcomes God into your living room. Abraham said, here's my son, God, my whole world. But he's vulnerable to death and to dying. He's saying, you're going to have to raise him to the, from the grave. God said, oh, yeah? Well, here's my son for the whole world and he destroys death. Abraham did the first act of true worship in the Bible, and the outcome was blessing, blessing. Why we worship? Blessing, blessing. Multiplication and the seed of triumph over evil. Death is forever conquered. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. Whose victory? The seed of Abraham. That's Jesus. Remember the story in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 22 of King Jehoshaphat? And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments and their enemies were destroyed. Unfortunately, some Christians today have begun to buy into this socialistic ideology and adapt to the concept of a spiritual socialism. Everyone wins, regardless of obedience. Debts are just canceled automatically, but without the price being truly paid for or justified. Do you remember Margaret Thatcher, the former British prime minister? She said this, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. It's a sin before God to steal, even if you call it legislation. There's still a spiritual curse that follows. 
that comes after. God saw our debt of sin and he paid for it with the price of his only begotten son's life, Jesus. The act of worship is an act of sowing. It's an extension of your faith, period. Worship of God does two things. It attracts the blessing and it brings down the hammer on all of evil, the curse. Now, don't let that bring fear into your heart with regard to a foolish son or daughter or a foolish parent. I've seen God bring down the hammer on false ideas, stupid thinking, bad habits, and evil relationships, all while saving, redeeming, and restoring the prodigal son or daughter caught in the snare. Worshiping God helps bring the precise threshing instrument of God's power so that what's wicked gets separated or winnowed from the profitable life. It's a process, but God does it, and he does it so good. Yes, that's why we worship parents, grandparents, sons and daughters. That's why we worship. Worship is weaponized to destroy the enemies of God. Remind me, why did Jesus come again? To destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came. Jesus has zero tolerance for pretend worship, and he calls it out. Look at Mark 7, verse 7. In vain, fruitlessly and without profit, do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments and precepts of men. You see, God gets no pleasure out of vain, useless worship. Worship that has no outcome. Worship without the blessing or harvest following is intolerable to God. It's empty. There's no hammer of destruction to the enemy's works. And God wants results for you, for your family, for me. Say it out loud again. Outcome, outcome, outcome. Where's the outcome? If God inhabits the praises of his people, and we see that in Psalm 22, verse 3, but you are holy, O you who inhabits the praises of Israel, God's people, Where's the outcome? If God shows up in your life, there needs to be, there should be outcome. Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. I want you to think critically for a moment. Is it possible for God to show up, the creator of the universe, and absolutely nothing happen? Zero outcome? No light? No potential? I've seen worship leaders and participants with more devotion to being seen and heard than true kingdom results from God's presence being honored. If the worship on Sunday morning isn't showing up in your life Monday and Tuesday with kingdom results, you need to rethink your time investment. If you're just spinning your wheels in human ritual with no outcome, are you really okay with that? I'm not. That's not why we worship. It's impossible to have God's presence ushering in all of his goodness and blessing, but at the same time, not have his enemies being scattered, destroyed, and melt like wax. That's what we read in Psalm 68. God can deal with your enemies. Did you know that anthrax can kill an elephant in just hours? That's an invisible enemy bringing down a powerful giant of an animal weighing in at well over 10,000 pounds. The invisible enemy is the critical. The Bible is full of wars against visible enemies to help give us a picture of our own spiritual fight against our invisible enemies. Because our inner reality steers our outer reality, it's important to remember that the greatest fight is within, the war for the real estate of your heart and your mind. Don't be one of those people who obsess about everything externally while they daily surrender their soul to spiritual anthrax that's hijacking their destiny. Worship God who can strengthen you with his power and might from within. Be strong in the Lord. Ephesians 6, verse 11 and 12 say this, Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand up against all the schemes and strategies and the deceits of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the supernatural places. This is Bible talk. This is New Testament talk, and you need to be armed and dangerous. That's you. Faith is your shield, but the sword of the Spirit is God's word. Activate it, talk it, sing it. Use God's word and principle to worship God. In being a true worshiper, you activate the Lord's power over his enemies. 
your enemies. About six years ago, I got really bad news about somebody that I dearly love. It was bad medical news about a loved one who really is a hero in my life. And with everything else going on, all the demand and all the craziness, I felt alone, crushed. I felt weak, even lost. Evil was trying to stake its claim. It was trying to take my land, overtake me with fear and anxiety, push in on my mental real estate. I knew I had to worship God, not because I felt like it, but I needed his victory. I began to bless the Lord. I began to magnify the Lord. I began to praise his name. I began to feel the weight of God weaponizing my praise, my worship. My attention was shifting from what was impossible to what God had already done. From what was evil to who was the almighty, all-powerful, unfailing, unlimited one. Praise God for the victory of the cross. I trust in you, Lord. That's what I would say over and over. I trust in you, Lord. I know this is happening, but I trust in you. Sometimes at night I'd lay in bed feeling fear, trying to squeeze the life out of me. And quietly I'd begin to sing Pam's song. In the presence of the Lord, there is joy. And the joy of the Lord is my strength over and over and over. The weight of darkness would suddenly shift to the force of power, love, and a sound mind. The weight would shift from fearing the evil report to knowing God's unfailing promises for eternity. The weight would shift from the sadness and the depression to being filled with unspeakable joy, the joy of the Lord. Right now, you can weaponize your worship with God's spirit and truth. Sickness must bow to the truth. Shame cannot stand against God's spirit. Depression runs from worship. Sorrow and sadness have to run and flee. Cancer, dementia, leukemia, arthritis, heart disease, all hate true worship. The anointing that's on true worship, poverty and division are powerless against the truth. Those evil spirits run from worship. Worship the Lord right now. Worship his name. Lift up your voice. Go on the attack and worship the name of the Lord. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.